All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining us here today. I'd like to give a big warm welcome to Chris Connolly, who is joining us here this morning to talk to us about uh, trans states and brain patterns. He's done some interesting research on this. Chris has a master's in science. He's, and he is a DSNU. He's a, a long-standing spiritualist with a keen interest in conducting research and experiments in spiritualist phenomena and the psychological processes involved in spirit communication. And he's joining us this month to talk about his research into trance and he'll illustrate changes in brain patterns and the trance condition. Now, Chris is also a tutor at the Morris Barbonell Center, and though he hasn't actually told me this in his bio, he's also very much involved in the science and spiritualism research that goes on in the lab at the Arthur Finley College just outside Linden. He's also a member of the esteemed uh, Society for Cyclical Research and the British Psychological Society. So I'd like to welcome you this morning, Chris. Um, and Thank you. Very much look forward to hearing your talk on trance and brainwave patterns. Thank you very much. Let me uh, get the presentation up for you. Thank you for the invite uh, for, for doing this talk. Um, I wanted to just do a bit of presentation on some of the, the studies I've done looking at uh, trance in particular, but looking at how we can bridge the gap between science and spiritualism. So what I've got here is a, a short presentation just showing you some of the things that I've learned and some things that I've discovered uh, over the last several years working with various trance mediums to understand a little bit more about what trance is from an academic research perspective. So the question comes, often comes, and people ask me the question, that why do we actually you know, look at the research on this sort of thing? And especially, you know, why is science particularly important within the, the spiritualist context? And very often people think of science being the opposite to religion. And I know being a spiritualist for the past 20 odd years, uh, I was sort of like brought up with the concept, you know, you try and avoid and try and stay away from the science sort of thing or academia or research because there's just like the big bogeymen who are out there to try and disprove our claims and uh, belittle us as much as we can. But actually you'll find that science and religion actually go hand in hand. Uh, both provide a very uh, unique way of explaining the observable phenomena in our world. And of course, some of the phenomena are best explained in metaphysical terms, uh, and hence in enlightenment and uh, other phenomena, um, whereas other terms are better explained using the scientific sort of formation of force and energy. And so it's just a way of explaining uh, observable facts, observable phenomena in our world. And of course, as spiritualists, you know, we're often taught, and especially you know, members of the SNUI, I would expect you've all been taught and have heard of the threefold aspects of, of spiritualism, which involves religion, philosophy, and science. But interestingly, if you go on and do something like your G1, your administration sort of courses, foundation courses, you'll find that actually within the SNU, there's actually no mention of science within the Articles of Association, the memorandum or within the bylaws. As such, as I've often said, now science is often poorly represented within spiritualism as a community. Now you get fringes of little bit pockets, but really I think if we want to promote spiritualism and promote the threefold aspects, we should give the religion, the philosophy and science equal justice, equal weighting in that uh, in our in our way of life in our, in our in our religion so several years ago my aim was to explore how science can be given a fair representation within spiritualism and there was a number of things that with the cooperation of uh, minister david bruton president of the snu and and northampton university and buckingham university and other uh, universities and uh, people uh, example Tanya from the, the college, the AFC college, um, we've also like come together to try and uh, explore how we can do this. And uh, my research interests in particular uh, was to explore whether anything could be done to make sitting, developing in circle more efficient. Very traditional <coughs> means of development involves you know, sitting in circle, 
sitting in a group with a circle leader and so forth and, and just sitting and just allowing things to happen. Now that's great, that's fine, we're not going to belittle that, that's been, that's worked for, for a millennia. But as a, a scientist, engineer myself, you know, I'd like to try and find out, well, can we make improvements to that? Because I think we need to progress. We can't keep necessarily, providing we're respectful of the ways things have been done and respectful and the cooperation of the spirit world. I don't see any, I don't see a contradiction in looking for ways that we could learn to progress in some way, using maybe his technology, using different psychological techniques, uh, uh, hypnosis techniques, or what have you. you know, just looking to see what we can do to actually make uh, our sitting more efficient. Our development more efficient. And so I asked the question, should it take years to develop your mediumship? You know, if you listen to a lot of the, the mediums and the tutors, they often talk about it taking years and years and so forth. But, but you know, it, granted, you know, developing your mediumship is a lifelong study. I don't, I don't disagree with that. But to actually that point where you feel confident to be able to connect with the spirit world, should that really take years to develop? I mean, Mediumship is a natural ability, so should it take years to develop that ability? And sort of like, can science offer insights that may benefit the medium? So again, going back to looking at the research, what can we actually learn from that? What can we learn from academia? What can we learn that's maybe already out there that perhaps we don't know about? And, uh, and something I feel quite passionate about and something I'm quite interested in is actually trying to take what is out there, what academia have learned, what researchers have learned about mediumship, about the way the brain works, what about uh, the psychology and the neuroscience and so forth, and see and actually see whether we could actually formulate a training strategy, a training approach that's more evidence-based. So instead of just sitting and waiting, yes, we still always need a cooperation of the spirit world, otherwise we're not a medium. But what can we do individually as the medium, as the if like the vehicle? Of which this uh, works through. Now, what can we do as the medium to improve that communication and perhaps speed up that process? And uh, most importantly, also, what can we do to empower spiritualists to do their own research? You know, I often get frustrated that I've got to work with people who know very little about spiritualism, very little about mediumship, and yet they're the ones writing. In the academic papers, they're the ones that are getting the books published, they're the ones that are getting credited for finding this out, finding that out. And it's like, well, no, we're the spiritualists, you know, we live it and we breathe it every day. Why aren't we doing our own research? Why don't we have a committee of spiritualists, you know, within the SNU, for example, formulating um, our research ideas using the mediums that we are, we're friends with, or our colleagues. And they're actually exploring what it is that we're actually doing. So how do we do this? So, as I said before, what I've been doing over the last few years is trying to work closely with uh, researchers and academias and learn so we can learn from each other. And uh, an important thing here, a uh, light bulb moment for me was, I think it was in 2014, we held a, uh, a science week at the Arthur Finley College and we had a professor from Northampton University uh, come down and he, we worked quite closely together. And he did a, a talk at, uh, at the beginning. Most of you know, may know, if you've been to the Arthur Finley College at the start of the course, all the tutors get up and give an introduction of themselves and a bio and what they hope to achieve on the, on the course and so forth. And uh, this professor stood up and, uh, and gave a, a talk that I thought was actually like a light bulb, light bulb moment for me because he pointed out that as uh, a man of science himself, it doesn't necessarily mean that he never or wasn't aware of something like experiences or paranormal experiences or transpersonal experiences, you know. And as a, and as a, a scientist himself, he found that even though he had these experiences, that he couldn't actually speak to his colleagues about them because if he spoke to his colleagues about them and they were sort of like thinking you know, like balmy or gone a bit loopy and wasn't being objective and critical and yet if he came to the spiritualists to talk about them 
you know, we would shun them away, shun him away because he was a professor, he was from the researchers. So we were like keeping researchers at bay. And so he pointed out that actually he felt it was very much no man's land. And that for me, so like illustrated the point, you know, that we do as spiritualists sometimes think ourselves as a, a closed shop, you know, and we do need to try and keep ourselves open because you know the spirit the, the expressions we get the the senses that we get from the spirit world you know the information we get from the spirit the the experiences we get from the spirit world don't just happen to spiritualists they happen to the whole wealth and the whole range of um the general public at large and so we have to be mindful of that and remember that there are members of the public who who don't have the knowledge we have but may benefit from having it and uh, in particular, those that are researchers, you know, those who are, you know, got their, you know, their PhDs, their degrees and so forth, you know, they too have these experiences. So why aren't we engaging with them and explaining with them what their experiences actually mean to them? So another factor we've done is work with various um, universities, the SBR and the AFC, the college, and established a lab at the college so we could actually um, work with mediums and has a single place where research from around the world can come and submit a proposal to the Arthur Finley College saying they'd like to do this research and uh, pending approval of that, that research proposal, the researchers can come to the Arthur Finley College, there's an established lab there that they can use um, to, to do their research with mediums and, and spiritualists alike. And that's very important because time and time again, we find that researchers have limited exposure to mediums and, uh, and spiritualists. And again, because of that, they'll, they'll use all sorts of methods to try and recruit mediums. And I'll give you an example. Uh, I recently came up uh, a number of years ago uh, with a conversation with uh, someone who was doing their PhD, looking at mediumship, looking at the evidence that mediums gave and it was recruiting mediums off Facebook. It was basically saying to the face, I sent a post on Facebook saying, if there's any mediums out there, would you like to type, like to take part in this research? And I contacted uh, the, the guy that was doing the research and I said to them, well, how do you know that your the people who are responding are actually mediums? And, uh, and basically in, in a roundabout way, he basically said he didn't care. He had a PhD to do. And you know, and he trusts the people who are going to reply. If they reply them, if they say they're mediums, they are mediums. That to me was a little bit concerning. So I thought, no, there's all sorts out there. You know, how do we know that uh, these people are actually mediums? And, and of course, he will then get a paper published based on his uh, results that may show unfavourably towards spiritualists. Whereas if we have a lab at the college, then obviously we have a place where we've got the uh, world-class tutors, medium tutors, uh, world-class students in many respects as well, uh, that uh, the academia can actually use to give proper, solid um, uh, res results and, and conclusions from. Uh, another thing we might need to do is obviously be prepared to partake in research. You know, as, uh, as mediums, a lot of our training involves working in churches or perhaps working up doing private systems across SNUI and so forth. But how many of us have actually been trained to be able to work within the sterile environment of a university lab? But of course, if we want to work more and more with academia, perhaps we need to think about improving some of our training so we're able to work in that sort of environment as well. And to provide knowledge to better inform exponents. But as I said before, to do our research and share our research amongst academia and other spiritualists. So before we go on to look at the, uh, the brain activities and things I've, I've done, I need to explore a little bit about what spiritualist trance is. We call the operational definition of spiritualist trance. Um, so what is spiritual trance? Now, I'm assuming all you buddy SNUI people there would know precisely what we mean by spiritualist chance, but just to, to clarify, you know, spiritual chance is a form of mental mediumship, a part of the control class. Um, and as always, as it includes mental medium, medium includes mental mediumship, it requires the mental faculties 
of the medium and as such the information is always still colored by the medium's own consciousness um, it's an altered state of consciousness and like all states of consciousness there's no real sort of definitive sort of um, uh, cut off point I mean, what is trance what is not trance and so forth you know there's a whole varying ranges and degrees of trance and in particular when it comes to the depth of trance as well and I know that myself in particular in the earlier days when I was developing a sitting for the trance states you know the question that often comes is how do we know it's from spirit and uh, and the well-known trance medium Ursula Roberts uh, answering a self-posed question on the authenticity of her own trance communication commented how can I be sure that it's a state of trance control and not just a submerged part of my own mind which has become active and the only way she says you could actually uh, uh, respond to that question would be just to say the medium must uh, examine the results of the control of the communication are you able to say things which you are not previously in your mind which were not previously in your mind unfortunately at the time that may have been sufficient but we now know that um, in, in uh, neuroscience and psycho cognitive psychology there's all sorts of things going on in our mind that we may not be aware of that actually it's within the mind itself so another question is often asked about trance and the reason i'm going through this is later on when you look at the results of the eeg and things um you'll find that a lot of stuff that we see is actually contradictory but let's just carry on for a second so what depth is required for trance and uh you know because trance exponents can look like they're asleep or very relaxed and so forth and therefore development of trance phenomena beginners often seek total unconsciousness or deep trance but I found this uh, uh, quote from Silver Birch that basically said that I must use the subconscious mind to direct his body and it becomes quiescent in sleep. Trance is not the same as sleep. In other words, you know, there's some level of activity in the mind must be necessary. Okay, and that's important because time and time again, when I'm invited to go around and sit in other trance circles, to give advice in, in, that, in that circle, now, what I'm aware of very often is individuals, exponents, sitting for the trance states and being there, allowing that power of the spirit world to draw close. So you can sense, you know, as, I'm as a medium myself, you know, you can see and feel and sense the spirit control coming close to the individual exponent who's developing the trance, but they're resisting. They're resisting because they're waiting to become unconscious. And it's like, no, don't do that. If you're aware of the spirit presence, you just send the thought out to spirit, what is it you wish to say? And, and because there's some activity, because they have this idea that they have to be unconscious. Okay? And it's important, at least for some people, you know, there are some who go unconscious, but for majority, you know, there is a level of, um, uh, should we say, a conscious awareness. And there has to be some activity within the mind. And again, another example, uh, spiritualist researcher Horace Leaf wrote regarding trance mediumship that most developing mediums aspire to become unconscious largely because they feel that it would be quite sure their utterance and manifestations were of supernormal origin. This tends to retard psychic unfoldment as are all forms of mediumship are constitutional. Unconsciousness cannot be induced and it may and one may take it for granted but if it was necessary, i.e. if it was necessary from the spirit world to, to, to induce unconsciousness into the individual, we may be sure the unseen operators will encourage anything that would contribute to the value of the phenomena. So the same there, quite clearly, that you know, trans medium should be constitutional. It varies for different people, different individuals. And of course, if the spirit world needed you to be unconscious, I'm sure they have the opportunity and the knowledge and the know-how to make you unconscious if of the trance state but that seems to fly in the face of what trance mediums tell us because if you go up to a trance medium and ask them were they aware of what was going on when they were talking invariably they often say no they weren't aware 
But we have to be careful here because their lack of awareness doesn't necessarily mean it's a level of depth of trance or level of depth of altered state. You know? And I know as a hypnotherapist that I can induce hypnosis into a client who will be very, very deep state of uh, hypnotic trance, but still be mentally aware of what's going on and still be aware they're sitting in the in the in the surgery or sitting very much and aware in the, in the in the seat in the in the room that I do the hypnotherapy in, you know, and vice versa. So awareness is not the same. It's not a good predictor of depth of trance. And so um, we need to bear that in, that in mind when you are sitting for trance. Because I'm sure some of you out there may be sitting for a trance development in some form. And of course, there have been number of studies and this is where my trance research started or my interest in trance research started started because i came across a paper uh, written in 1937 uh, an article written in the science of psychical research and it was looking at written by uh, two researchers called goldney and soul and they were looking at the uh, the trance medium of eileen of eileen garrett and uh, what they were doing, they decided to try and connect the medium Eileen to a load of physiological instruments. So they took blood samples, they took um, the breathing, rasp, the, the pulse rate, and all sorts of things, because they believed that if it was a, a different personality coming forward and taking control, shall we say, of the medium's body, as they thought, you know, they believe that the physiological signs, you know, the pulse, the blood constitution and so forth, should be different. Okay, and the measures were taken before, during and after the trance demonstration. Which I thought was quite ambitious, because, you know, even as a, as a, med as a medium, to, to be sitting there and knowing you're having uh, needles sort of stuck in you while you're, saying, while you're in trance, and after you're in trance and so forth, I thought was quite uh, generous of Mrs. Arlene Garrett. But when they looked at the results, they actually found no significant differences, which may not be any surprising. Any significant differences were found between the physiological measures that was measured, um, that was seen with Arlene Garrett. And, uh, and so I thought, well, that's kind of interesting because that was in 1937. And the thought rose, well, no, our technology is a lot more sensitive now. You know, I mean, it's almost 100 years, you know, 90, 80, 90 years ago that was. So our technology has moved on quite a bit from there. You know. Could we come up with some, um, some kind of contraction, some form of technology that could measure um, subtle changes that perhaps couldn't be measured back then? And of course, one use is EEG, and even back in 1952, um, they were looking at using EEG on mediums as well. And again, looking to see whether the brain patterns varied uh, between as different personalities came forth through the chance medium. And again, Iron Garrett agreed to take part in this uh, study. And they said that although there were slight changes that were detected, there was no significant E changes um, as the different controls and as the medium went in and out of the trance state. But again, I thought, well, you know, this is 1952, you know, over 60, 70 years ago, and uh, you know, the technology has moved on. I mean, if you look at the papers written in 1952, you know, they don't even talk about uh, the gamma states and the uh, eta states and so forth and they just talk about alpha uh, delta alpha beta, beta and theta now there's the, the four states and predominantly that's because they didn't have the technology to measure additional higher vibration higher brain activity higher brain states so coming across those papers i thought to myself well is there something you know could we use technology today to detect a change now, not being medically trained, I thought it would be a bit of a tall order to asking for volunteers, you know, trans mediums to come forward with the view of me and you know, start jabbing in the needles. And I'm not sure they would uh, appreciate that. And of course, I suppose there's ethics and ethics balls to consider as well. 
So I decided to go for something a little less, um, a little less challenging. And I started to look at, so to measure the emotional arousal that may occur between uh, alleged genuine trance states and what I call pseudo trance. I mean, pseudo trance meaning uh, individuals who may believe they're in trance or individuals who are pretending to be in trance, but aren't in trance. And uh, emotional arousal, that can be quite uh, can be measured quite uh, unobtrusively, if you like, by using some sensors on the fingertips. And many would re may recognize this is very much like a lie detector sort of situation, except instead of giving you a, a yes, no sort of response, it actually just gives you, it measures over time the 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 level of arousal you know how how heightened state of awareness or heightened state of arousal that may be going on and uh and as i said you know the equipment used uh technology to measure the emotion states within the, the participants uh, i managed to get 16 trance mediums to partake in the study but eight were used uh, sorry 10 were used uh the reason being uh, i'll explain later but there were six I had to discount because they, although they sat for trance, they didn't actually speak. And what I decided beforehand was that the speaking, the medium would have had to have spoken to indicate they were in trance. Now, it was quite frustrating because I knew and I could sense as a medium that all 16 had a spirit control blending with them. But unfortunately, I couldn't use my mediumship as a, an objective measure I, just, I had to use something else so i decided to say well if the medium speak then that's their way of committing to the fact that they are the uh, they're in trance and hence i could use that measurement and then i also got 10 spiritualists who are non-trance mediums and to use to imitate trance now what i mean by imitate trance is that i put them in a, a stressful environment and, and the reason for that was to try and uh, imitate or try to represent maybe the, the emotional environment that the trance medium may feel themselves in when they're doing a, a public demonstration. So I put them in a, uh, a stressful environment, got them to close their eyes, and I asked them to just start talking about the philosophy of spirit or talk about their life or talk about um, what happened in their day or what have you. Really just so, because at the end of the day, as uh, the general public, if they went to see a demonstration, what they would likely see is someone with their eyes closed and talking, you know, maybe giving uh, messages or maybe giving philosophy. And so in both cases, this is what happened. I also later on tested uh, people that were in hypnosis and people that were just meditating as well. So this is what we call a experimental study because I'm what I'm doing is I'm comparing two groups. I'm comparing the trance mediums and I'm comparing the results from the non-trance mediums. Okay. And what we saw if we saw this graph here, if you can see my cursor at all, but um along the along the x-axis here um now that's the, the horizontal axis. Uh, it was about 10 minutes of time. These numbers at the bottom are in seconds. And on the, the, the y axis or the, the, the vertical axis is the, how much um, the, the participant was um, aroused, no, mentally aroused. Now, we would expect the, if their medium was relaxed as they, as they appear to be, when you look at a trance medium sitting quietly and just talking, you'd expect the, if anything, their arousal to go down because what's happening here is they're relaxing. But what we actually saw was that in about uh, after two, three minutes, you know, their, the arousal of the trance mediums in particular started to elevate, as you can see there by the, 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 uh, the thick orange line. And it just kept going. And what happened was that after they'd finished the trance, they started coming out of the trance, then the arousal dropped off again. Whereas those imitating trance, even though it went up slightly because I put them in a stressful situation, you know, 
their, their arousal level stayed pretty constant, pretty flat. And as I said, and I, I did this comparing these results with people that were in hypnotic trance talking and those that were meditators just talking. And again, all of them showed different levels of arousal, but the trance mediums showed greater level of arousal than all three groups put together. So it suggests that trance mediums were experiencing an increasing level or increasing a activation of the sympathetic nervous system. Basically, they were getting more, even though they looked relaxed, even though they, they come across as maybe relaxed, you know, the mediums internal processes or internally were, were experiencing a lot of stress and emotional arousal. And again, it suggests that there's something going on. You know that even though they're relaxed, there's a lot of activity going on in the brain, which is why, again, I stress that perhaps when we sit for trials, we shouldn't wait for that unconsciousness to occur because, you know, it clearly states that there is a level of conscious awareness uh, involved in trance mediumship and of course as i said here at the last line here it, it seems to be contrary of how we used to think of trance you know things may have been unconscious and relaxed so that was very interesting and uh, and this I was, I was able to present at the uh, annual conference of the sbr the scientific cycle research back in 2014 and i've got quite a, a lot of interest in this because again, it sort of like contradicted a lot of the, the spiritualist literature of what uh, trance was all about and the development of it. Now, moving on, moving on two years to 2016, I started coming across, um, I wanted to look at uh, EEG, basically looking at the brain activity going on, because so I thought that would be a more direct way of looking at it. And there is some literature around 2015, 2016 that was published looking at brain activity of mediums. But again, a lot of this literature, a lot of the research out there was using very expensive technology. They were using like 32 channel EEG headsets. And you may see, you may see pictures on this on, you know, uh, on documentaries and so forth, you know, where they're like the, the swimming cap and they've got maybe loads and loads of wires coming off the, of this cap that they were wearing. It's phenomenally expensive. You know, we're talking about 30, 40, 50,000 pounds for a, a state of the art or, or an industrial sort of research grade equipment. But I came across this little unit here that you can see in the corner. It's called the Muse Headband. And it's a commercial technology, but the data has been graded as research grade. So what it means is that the data is as good as you get from any of these 50, 60,000 pound equipment, uh, EEG equipment. The only downside is that this headband obviously can only measure a few points on the brain. This one here actually measures four points. And if you look at the, uh, the brain picture or the, the top view of the brain on the, in the middle picture here, you should be able to see at the front top or at the top, which is a frontal lobe, of the person's brain, you've got two dots, two black dots, and two dots on either side where it says two and 2.39. These are the points that it measures on the person wearing, wearing the, uh, the headband. And this, this uh, Muse headband uh, is Bluetooth. You just download some apps from either your Android, Google Store, or your app, or Apple Store and uh, you just download the apps and it syncs to the, the headband and it instantly produces your uses and tells you what's going on in your brain, which is kind of cool. Uh, and there are different types of apps that are out there. You've got ones that produce what's called a spectrogram, which basically gives you colors and, uh, and over time, it's like a scrolling picture and it gives you the sort of colors over the certain frequency ranges. Um, but what I decided to use was uh, some sort of topography package that gives you sort of like an image representation sort of thing. So you've got like a cut view of the brain and says, well, this is what's happening at this part, this is what's happening in that part of the brain, and so forth. And I'll explain a little bit more about that in a minute. So as I said, I use a topography uh, aspect or application. Uh, it's actually called OptiBrain. Uh, you can download that from uh, the App Store. 
and uh, and it measures the frontal and sides uh, of the of the person wearing the, of, the, of the brain uh, and what we know right, and what we know and this is how this is how the, uh, the topography works um, what happens is that at those four points the two front points and the two side points it measures the level of activity it's electrical activity and that was those parts of the brain and, uh, and it represents that as, a, as the numbers as you can see there but also it produces colors in that area and the colors range from a dark blue which represents very little activity up to red which represents a lot of activity you know high high motion activity or high activity and of course normal if like on every day, not much going on, is sort of like the midpoint of the green. And if you look at that image here, the picture you've got here, you can see blue at one end, and you can see red at the other end, you've got the colour scale in between. And so green is what you'd expect is uh, everyday state, not much is going on, and so forth. Um, if it was red, then you expect something's happening in that part of the brain, so that person is doing something related to that part of the brain so for example uh, if you look here the frontal lobe is the frontal part of the brain is, is uh, has been associated with um, cognition planning thinking and so forth so if you saw a, a brain image like you see here where there's a lot of activity a lot of red activity at the frontal lobe that suggests that that person, when that image was taken, is doing a lot of thinking, a lot of uh, cognitive thinking, a lot of planning, maybe maybe doing some mathematical exam, maybe doing some uh, some sort of uh, heavy duty thinking. Um, and of course, we know that there are slightly different uh, functions on the brain relating to the left and the right side of the brain and so forth. And you know, typically and generally, this is a very generalized example here, but generally, you know, the left side of the brain is associated with logical speech, verbal reasoning and so forth. And the right side is related to the abstract and creativity. So if we, for example, saw the whole brain being, uh, for example, green, that would suggest that there's not a lot of activity going on and the person's not doing much. If we saw it was all green apart from the, the left frontal lobe, that would suggest the person's thinking, okay, and but he's thinking rationally, thinking verbal reasoning, thinking that sort of thing. Um, okay, so that's essentially how you interpret very simply the, the topography of those sorts of uh, images. So what I did was, Let's, I went out and I recruited and asked some mediums if they wanted to partake in this study. And I'm going to explain three results of three mediums I found. And uh, there's one of the mediums there. Um, some of you may recognize, even though I blanked the face out, uh, some of you may recognize him. Um, but uh, you can see him sitting there wearing the headband. Uh, it was a headband on his head there. And the setup. You could see basically what happened was I had the medium and I had opposite the medium recipient, a table to their side that had recording equipment on it. And I was just sitting at the other end of the room with my iPad, capturing uh, measurements at certain stages. And so, but all the mediums we used were experienced at giving private sittings while in trance. And that's kind of important as well because this was very much what you brought that we regard as a field research. I didn't ask the medium to come to a sterile lab environment. What I wanted to do was actually make the medium feel very comfortable and just do what they normally do. You know, I didn't want to add any additional confounding vector or confounding variables to the, uh, uh, to, the, to, the, to the study at all. And uh, each medium was provided a recipient, unknown to the medium, and was asked to give them a trance sitting. So what we've got here, is uh, trance mediums who are experienced in trance sittings and as far as they're concerned apart from wearing a headband and um, they were just giving a trance sitting end of you know so it was very much a, a natural environment for them to work in and i'm just going to present some of the results to you now okay but before i do so let's just explain what the results were that i took the results are split into three sections, baseline, trance, and end. Now, what I did was, um, 
the baseline measurement I took uh, before the chance medium started. So at this point, what happened was I connected them up with the headband. I had a bit of a laugh and a joke with them, just had a general chit chat and uh, they weren't attuned to the spirit world. And this is the sort of like, I want to take their brain activity of them just being them, just being their normal selves. So this is a baseline reading. Um, then uh, the next reading I took was their reading when they were in trance. And very similar to when I measured the emotional arousal, uh, what happened was I took the, uh, the, the readings or the measurements the moment the medium spoke. Because again, the act of speaking was used an objective means of the medium confirming their belief that they were in trance. So I just took a capture then to see, okay, that medium's now in trance, let's take a capture and see what their brain's doing. And then the last measurement I took was when the medium ended the trance. And the way they ended that was they opened their eyes and came back, so to speak. And at that point, I took another capture to see, well, this is what happens when they're back again. And the whole aim here is to see if we can find commonality between trance mediums, because we're trying to find not just what's going on, but, you know, is there something that's similar? You know, if, it's, if it, every trance medium is unique and different, then there's very little the EEG or this sort of thing can find us, because, you know, if one medium does this, another medium of another medium does something else, then it's, it's very random, very unique. But if we find that there is something common, then that commonality is interesting, because that commonality might allow us to find something or develop some, some sort of training program in the future. It may give us a hint or a clue as to what actually is going on. So let's have a look at three mediums or three results I got. So we've got medium one, two, and three. And you can see, as I said before, I took three measurements, the baseline measurement, a trance measurement, and an end measurement. And we're gonna go through one, one by one here. So in medium one, the baseline reading was as such. Now, what we're seeing here is a lot of activity on the sides, very symmetrical. So this person, I suggest, was actually quite emotionally stressed before they started because there's a lot of activity on the, on the temporal lobes with the sides. So this person, even though they may have had a nice little chit chat and a, and a chat to me, they were sort of like feeling the pressure of what was going on. Okay, then obviously I, I left them to it, let them do their, uh, set themselves down, close their eyes, allowed them to attune the spirit world, and as soon as they spoke, took the next reading. And this is the reading I got here. And this is very interesting because we see now, whereas in the baseline it was very symmetrical, you know, the left and right sides were very much or like mirror images of each other. Now in this situation, we're seeing that very much there's a lot of activity on the right side of the brain and not so much activity on the left side. So here in this medium, we're seeing a lot of activity in the creative, uh, abstract side of the brain and, and doing that sort of thing, but still activity in the frontal lobe as well. So there's still some processing going on, still some thinking going on, still some thought processes going on, see? So this is, was happening, this is how that would be, maybe that's how I would interpret what was going on with that part there. And then again, when they ended, there it is, it comes back here. And in this particular case, this medium came back and was probably nervous about what was going, I was gonna say. And so again, you've got a very symmetrical pattern. And again, the temporal lobes um, active, more active than anywhere else, indicating to me that maybe there was some sort of emotional um, uh, stressful uh, situation going on there, maybe a little bit of anxiety they were feeling afterwards. Okay, so that was medium one. Now that's interesting, right? So it doesn't tell us an awful lot. Let's have a look at medium two, because again, we're going to compare the readings from all these mediums to see if there's something, uh, there's some sort of similarity going on. So medium two, the baseline reading, again, I connected it up to medium two, had a chat with them, and then took a couple of readings. In this particular case, this medium here is a lot more green. So this person didn't feel emotionally stressed or emotionally aroused or anything like that. They felt very much generally okay, you know, not much going on. Very, very little activity going in the, the front left side at the front top here. It implies that they weren't doing a lot of rational thinking. There was no real constructive thinking going on at all. So this person is just 
well, so it's just chilly, you know, they were just having this conversation with me and just getting on with things. And then, like medium one, I allowed them to, to settle themselves down, close their eyes, attune with the spirit world, and as soon as they spoke, captured their results. And of course, if you haven't already twigged there, you know, you can see a very, you now again, on this particular one, you know, a lot of activity on the right side of the brain. Yes, again, very little activity or reduced activity on the left. And look how similar the images look. So here we've got something here between two very different mediums. And I'll, I'll also point out as well, medium one was a male and medium two was female. So it's, this is different, even though the similarities, it's not, a, not due to gender either. Um, but you can see very close similarities between these two mediums, which I thought was very interesting. And again, when the medium came out to the trance, Again, a very different state coming back out. In this particular case, this medium activity moved over more to the right side, so there's more um, maybe verbal reasoning, more emotional stresses on that side. But again, you know, you would probably expect uh, when they come out to be very different, you know, because people come out different ways and so forth. Like the baselines are very different because people are very unique, people are sitting down so forth but what's interesting is how the trance are very similar if almost identical the values are not but obviously the pattern in terms of the activity is and then we have a look at medium three medium three was another male um, and in this particular case before we started in the baseline reading it was all blue so this medium was actually quite relaxed very relaxed actually quite chilled with what was going on and then we moved on and allowed them to take, uh, take a deep breath, close their eyes, attune with the spirit world, and the next reading. Now, this one, not quite the same, but again, you can still see, oops, you can still see that there is more activity on the right side than on the left. And you can still see that the activity is very different from the uh, the baseline reading for medium three and almost you could see that there is could be you know if you allowed that medium to develop further or, or what have you there could be a you know could be as time develops maybe uh, more activity on the right side to become more like medium one and two perhaps i don't know and then at the end in again come back out and again very different now, what was also interesting for medium three was that as, I, as they spoke, I took a, a capture, but I also took a couple of captures every 15 seconds. And what you're seeing, what I'm showing you here is an averaging of all those captures. But what I found looking at medium three is every once in a while, whereas medium one and medium two predominantly showed a lot of right activity all the way through the captures while they're in trance, Medium three had that activity that you see there, but also this activity. So for some reason on medium three, they were fluctuating between having a lot of activity on the right side to then going back to where there's almost the brain is shut off. Almost the brain is almost in a passive, deep, relaxed, uh, almost unconscious state. You know, there's no activity at all going on. And uh, the whole, when I looked at the readings, this medium's activity was fluctuating between high activity, low activity, high activity, low activity. And it was having these long pit bursts of, of minutes at a time of low activity, and then there were minutes at a time of this high activity. And it was like, well, what on earth's going on? And I had to go back to my notes to re refer back to medium three and see exactly what medium three was doing. Now, medium one and medium two were giving trance sittings. So they were giving evidence and their control was coming forward and giving evidence of life after death and bringing loved ones through and so forth. Medium three, I forgot until I referred to my notes, was actually doing trance healing. And what we actually got here was the activity, the high activity, representing, almost representing medium one and medium two when they were in trance, with a moment in time when the medium's control came through and started speaking. I was actually given instructions and just talking to the recipient. The other activity that I was seeing when they were very 
the brain was very quiet, if you like, with those periods of time when the medium on the trance control was actually giving trance healing. So almost unintentionally, I captured here in medium three an example of a trance healer giving trance healing. You can see the activity there, at high activity when, they, when the control is speaking, very similar to medium one and medium two. And then when they go into the trance healing itself, the brain activity quietens down. And so I thought that was actually very interesting. So what do these results suggest? Well, these results suggest the right hemisphere may be involved in trance, in spiritualist trance, um, but the front left lobe because uh, is not involved in trance communication. But as you could see, the front left, the front top, if you like, of the brain, in every case, uh, when they go into trance, either has no activity or less activity or reduced activity than uh, the right hemispheres. So it suggests that the, um, the, the trance, when the medium's going to trance, there's a lot of activity on the right hemisphere, but very little at the frontal left lobe, which suggests that there is no rational thinking, there's no logical thinking going on and so forth. So again, this gives us a clue to when we're developing our mediumship and developing our trance to remember that if there's a, if you're sitting there and you're feeling a lot of logical thinking going on, that's probably suggestive that you're not actually in the trance state. Okay. Out of interest, I also captured the results of a spirit artist, which uh, I thought I'll, I'll show you. Now, if you remember, the frontal lobe is to do with thinking and planning and so forth. So you would naturally expect and probably like to expect that maybe the front part of the brain in those images would, would uh, if they're doing art would light up would be very bright would be very um, red a lot of activity there but what i found was this is the baseline of a spirit artist again all all green uh, so they weren't really particularly bothered about taking part in the experiment they were just chilling along with stuff what i expected to find is at the top to go red or their activity to go greater, you know, go red or go yellow, green, go some yellow, orange, red, so to speak. Uh, because I would think, I would think to myself that if they're drawing, there's a lot of planning activity going on. What I actually found, it was when they started drawing, the activity in the frontal lobe actually dropped. So there was less thinking going on. There was less planning going on. There was less activity there until. And when, as they were nearing completion of the drawing, there was even less, even less um, activity going on in the frontal lobe and on the left side you can see there, you know, suggesting that as, as a spirit artist draws, or, has, or at least how this spirit artist draws, this particular spirit artist was drawing, there was no, no thinking about where that pencil was going, there was no thinking about where that hand was moving, there was just no activity there at all. It was all purely sort of... Uh, intuitive because i don't know how you could measure intuition here but you know there is there's no activity on the frontal lobe which contradicts again what maybe a skeptic would say when they're saying well all they're doing is just drawing a picture you know well when i compared these readings with an artist within the family i did see activity in the frontal lobe so you know it, it, there is something very different going on between a spirit artist and that of a as we say a, a normal artist so it suggests there's something going on with the right side of the brain, the right hemisphere of the brain. So that leads us then to think, well, what could we do that may strengthen, if you like, the resources or the pathways, the neuronal connections going on on the right side of the brain? Because we know that uh, with practice, you know, if we, uh, we can sort of like generate new pathways in the brain, that may actually facilitate or may benefit uh, our mediumship. So things such as creative hobbies and pursuits requiring extended attention, because remember the frontal lobe on the right side was still very active as well, and that's our attention and our focusing and so forth. Um, you know, so things like art, creative drawing, music, symbolism, poetry, including those sorts of things into your life 
may strengthen neural pathways on the right side of the brain, which may make your mediumship, I don't want to say easier, that's probably the wrong word to use, but may, let's say this way, you may have more resources to hand over to the spirit world to use. And again, mindfulness, uh, there's been numerous studies that have shown after repeated practice, there's an increase in pathways and connections being made on the right hemisphere of the brain again. And interestingly, if you follow any Buddhist teachings, you'll find that, that, um, that it's well known within Buddhism and, 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 and meditation practices that psychic phenomena occurs, mediumistic phenomena occurs, but because they're not interested in that, you know, they sort of like dismiss it. And of course, of course, these sort of practices also involve a lot of mindfulness and meditation practices. So um, it's no surprise that they experience those sorts of phenomena as well. Now, what I'm saying here is that I'm not suggesting that you've got to um, do something creative before you go out and demonstrate. What I'm suggesting here is we need to incorporate this sort of uh, right brain activity into our life because society today is very much left brain activity very much left right you now everything's logical everything's sort of rational everything's to do with critical thinking objective thinking and what we need to do is just try and keep a balance you know try and encourage in our life you know the creative pursuits as well because that will keep the right side of the brain the pathways active the pathways going and interestingly uh something else that may that actually does benefit i believe benefits um, the right side of the brain as well is this practice called sitting in the power now many of you might have heard of this but this is a technique taught by the late glenn edwards who was a wonderful medium and uh and there's all sorts of versions of sitting in the power that have come out since but as far as i'm aware glenn edwards was the, the originator of it because he used to tell a story that he used to, uh, there was a point where he spoke to a, a trance control called James, who was the control of a medium called Mark Webb. And Glyn one day asked James uh, what it was that he could teach or he could give students to take away with them after they came, after they spent the week at the Arthur Finley College or after the, wherever he was teaching. What is it that you could get the students to do as a like homework uh, while they're away from the workshops and the weeks. And uh, apparently, uh, this was a technique that the spirit world gave, um, gave us as students to, to practice when, between uh, times of uh, workshops and so forth. And if you look at the steps, which are focused on the breath, if you're aware of sitting in the power, you'll be familiar with this, but there are four steps, predominant four steps in sitting in the power. One is focusing on the breath, the awareness and the feeling of expansion, being aware of the spirit power and being aware of God's power. But if you look at those and associate those with the types of brain activity you'd associate with those things, you know, you see that they're all related to the right side. Now, I'm not suggesting that James, the spirit control of Mark Webb was some sort of neuroscientist who knew exactly what he was talking about. But I just feel it's, it's kind of ironic or kind of coincidental that the practice that we're told the spirit world gave us to develop our own mediumship so happens also develops the brain active or neuro pathway activities on the right side of the brain. Um, but anyway, and of course, each step there encourages a focused awareness and right brain activity. So I thought that was interesting, coincidental perhaps. So in conclusion, because I'm aware of the time, in conclusion, there's a lot of misunderstanding surrounding the practice and demonstration and development of spiritual chance. And unfortunately, this tends to feed into the training and development given to individuals sitting to develop trance. And a lot of myths out there, there's a very good trance mediums who don't know why they're trance mediums and don't know the mechanics behind it but that's fine if they're, they're good but you know it's important if they go out to teach they need to understand this there are physiological indicators that seem to be present when the individual is in a spiritual trance that don't seem to be present in any other altered state so here i'm referring to the the uh, meditators the the pseudo trance or the imitation trance and the, the hypnotic trances and so forth you know, they don't have the same physiological measures, they physical indicators 
as when a medium goes into a spiritual child. So very different activities going on. And when someone is in a spiritual child state, the combination of the active right hemisphere of the brain and passive front frontal lobe seems to be indicative of a spiritual child state. So here, do we have a measure or do we have an end way of determining whether someone's in trance or not? Now, obviously, we need to test more and more, and more mediums, get a greater sample and make sure that's the case. But just from the sample I've seen, I've just shown you, and, uh, and this marries up with the samples of other samples I've done, it seems to suggest that right hemisphere of the brain and passive left frontal lobe, they seem to, think, seem to be very common amongst the trance mediums that I've measured. So can we use that to to promote training, can we use like neurofeedback perhaps, to use the techniques to encourage that, maybe. So as I said here, could these indicators uh, uh, measured using commercial technology, and again, that's important as well because you know, everything I've done here is using technology you can get from Amazon. Seriously, you can go to Amazon, you can buy that news, and you can do it, you do the same work that I've just done yourself. Um, and that's important because we all, want, we all want to be the researchers here. You know, measures using commercial technology be used to develop uh, an evidence-based training approach for exponents. Uh, but again, always with a corporation spirit. And again, you know, we have to be mindful of the fact that you know we might do the work on us, but we always to be a successful trans medium. You know, you always need the cooperation of the spirit world uh, to come forward. So. What I wanted to present to you was just a summary uh, of what I found. To give you an indicator if you are sitting for trance, you know, please don't sit there thinking you've got to be unconscious because, you know, not only does the, does the spirit world and, and our past researchers suggest that it's not the case, but, you know, using the technology that I've used over the last several years, it all seems to suggest that there's got to be, there's got to be a part of you in the process. And without that you bit, you know, the trans, the trans mediumship is, uh, is problematic. Okay. And I'll open, I think I open the floor to any questions now. Does anyone yes, want to come in? Fabulous, Chris, thank you. If you want to, um, if you want to turn off your screen share, we'll be able to actually see you. So everybody wants to know what you look I'm like. Does anyone want to do that? <laughs> Anybody like to see you, Chris? You <laughs> Hold a second. No, no, yeah. Let me see if I can get this. Okay. Um, so that was I, that was a really great and really really interesting talk. I really uh, really found the. Um, there you are. Oh, there I one. am. Can you see me yet? No. Let no. me see. Me no, sit. Front cam. Front cam. Get my hair sorted quick. There, there you go. You go. Oh, there, there I you am. Go. There I am. Very handsome. Right. So um, I just asked people just to, as they go, just to type questions into the chat box and we'll, I'll field them to you. Yep, okay. One thing I found very interesting um, with the, we'll all be running out to Amazon now, we'll all, all the little headbands will be sold out by this evening on Amazon. We'll all go excellent, out. excellent. Um, but you know, one qu question I had for you, Chris, was so often in mediumship, we hear people talk about perhaps there is or there is a difference between, you know, psychic, picking up psychic phenomena and picking up mediumistic information. Um, is there, it would be really interesting, it, does the head, with the headband, is it that fine tune that we'd be able to tell, we'd be able to see different parts of the brain light up if we were working? Um, Psychically or mediumistically? Yeah. Yeah. Now you see, the thing is, I've not, I've not looked at that. But again, you see, what excites me about these sort of questions shows me that you know, people are thinking. And if you, if people would get these headbands themselves, as I said, they're commercial technology. You can get it from Amazon. You can download the apps from the app stores and so forth. You know, you can go out and find yourself. You know, you don't have to have a PhD or you don't have to have a, have a degree in this. But absolutely, it would be. Uh, I'm making a note of that myself. Uh, it would actually be very interesting to have a look and see if someone maybe was doing some sort of psychometry, yes. doing some sort of psychic activity, and then can, you know, maybe put the object down afterwards and then make that connection with the spirit world. You know, yeah. what are the differences? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Absolutely. And that's, sort, that's the sort of thing you can do in a, your own development circles. Yeah. You know? 
It's something that I think all we all struggle with at one point. You know, we all at some point go, did I pick that up psychically or did I get that from the spirit person? So, so it'd be really Absolutely. interesting for ourselves to even help us with our Absolutely. Be fantastic. All right. So Angela has just asked, Chris, can you give us the name of that equipment again? That we can yep. Use? It's called, it's called the Muse Headband. The Muse Headband. Yeah. Can you see that? Yes, Muse headband, thank you. Muse, there you go. You can get it from Amazon. We'll all be buying them this afternoon. All right, so yes. Kathy wants to know, what advice could you give someone wishing to explore this area further and can you recommend any books that would be helpful to read? Um, it depends on what aspects of chance or in this area you wish to explore. There are a lot of, um, of books, but I would recommend actually, if you're interested in the scientific research that occurred with mediums in particular, you, know, you can join the SBR, the Society for Cycle Research, and then you get access to their online library. And that way you have over 100, what, almost 150 years worth of uh, published research. Oh, I didn't and know you can just, yeah, you can get the online library and you can join that and uh, everything up to from 1882 to 2012, you'll have access to all the papers. So we talk, I mean, we were talking about the pioneers of Oliver Lodge and uh, William Crooks and all this. They were all members of the SBR and it's really interesting going back and we talk about them being pioneers and actually reading, actually reading what they actually thought of spiritualists, you know, uh, because you know, they were pioneers, but they also had their doubts as well in some respects. But um, you can actually read the papers, especially um, uh, uh, William Crooks in particular, and uh, his work with Katie King and so forth. You know, he, all, all his work is all, all published by the SBR, and you can just get access to it and read it. Fantastic. And we have... Um Tricia Robertson with us next month, who was the former president of the SBR in Scotland, the Scottish division. So, oh, yes, yes, we'll yes, yes, yes. lovely lady. Yeah. All right, so Arthur wants to know, um, oh, Arthur wants to know how much are the are the headsets? I suppose we can just go to Amazon and check that out. Probably change yes, I think they're about 230, 230 pounds. Right. Which sounds it sounds a lot, but if you was, for example, in a group, a circle or development group, um, you know, you could probably chip in all together and purchase one. Mm. So, Kristen, um, it's the uh, SPR, the Society for Cyclical Research Library. Yeah, SPR. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. All right, I got that. All right, Arthur wants to know. Um, how did the objective measurements correspond with the subjective assessment as a medium? Do you mean by the medium, Arthur, or do you mean Chris's assessment of the medium? What? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll try and give some responses, I think. But um, the, as far as the, obviously I questioned, interviewed the mediums after taking the measurements after the trance city, and as far as they're aware, they were relatively happy with how they conducted the city. And most of the cases, these trans mediums said they weren't aware of what was being said. Again, we should, we should be indicating that that doesn't give you an indication of the depth of trance. And they relied, like most mediums do, they relied on the feedback from the recipient as to whether the trance city went well or not. Um, regarding my own awareness of what was going on uh, as a medium myself um, in terms of what I was aware of, you know, I had to try and ignore that as much as possible because I didn't want that to influence um, any of the readings that I was taking, or to bias any of the readings I was taking. Mm. And so Arthur's just followed up with, and how did you feel yourself about the event? Um, as I said, no, I was aware, the, obviously, as a medium, I was aware the spirit were there. I was aware it was a genuine trance, uh, as far as I was concerned, condition. So I was quite happy with that. But again, I had to put that to one side and use the the, the fact they spoke, the trance medium spoke as the objective measure that they were in trance. You know, I can't, I can't. I couldn't take, start taking measurements because I sensed the spirit world was with them. Because, you know, if anyone asked me, well, how did you sense it? That leaves me open to a whole host of complex sort of uh, debating questions and so forth. 
but you didn't measure yourself. And no, I actually, can't measure myself now. It's an interesting question because we had Dr. Dean Raiden here with us last month, and mm -hmm. they have done they haven't done a lot of work we, on with mediums, but they've done a lot of work with over ions with um, psychics and ESP and. Uh, yes, that's right. Yeah. Question. I was wondering in your case. As a you know, being mediumistic yourself, if that actually ever interferes, or is it actually an advantage? Well, it's actually, it works both ways. It can be a disadvantage because people would say, you know, the academic community or the scientific community may see I've got a, there's a conflict of interest there mm. because, you know, you know, I'm an SNU member, you know, I obviously want to, I'm a spiritualist, you know, I obviously want to put forward a positive light in this respect. But as I've often said to, as I've always said to them, is, you know, I, I capture the data and you're welcome to view the data. You know, my conclusions, I'm sure you'll come to the same conclusions. And, but it's also beneficial because I believe because I'm a spiritualist, because I'm a medium, other mediums obviously will trust you more because you know, they know you're not out to prove, to, to, to make them look stupid or to prove it wrong in, in a sense that you know you're not to belittle them what you're trying to do is just capture what goes on right. you know, that's all you're doing you know we can't prove the spirit world through this we can only demonstrate what goes on that may help us make a better connection with this place we call the spirit world you know um, whereas a lot of uh, uh, mediums are quite fearful of working in this way because working with academia or researchers because they're, they're afraid that researchers are going to come back to them and say actually you're not in trance and you weren't doing mediumship you weren't doing this you would actually if we just to cut um, make a point here no one in the scientific community can ever tell any medium that they're not a medium mm. you know okay. it can't be done yes okay good. it cannot be done and probably the fear of that must cause some stress on the medium going into going into a controlled situation like that, I would imagine. It does. And this is why I said that, you know, if we want to start working and being more open with the scientific community, I think it's uh, incumbent on, you know, maybe like the SNU or other organisations to start providing training programmes so that, you know, as I said, mediums feel like they can partake in this research studies without fear of, of of anyone judging their own beliefs, do you know? I mean, I've taken part in SBR research. Some research has been positive, some research has been inconclusive. That doesn't mean I'm not a medium, it just means that the results were inconclusive. You know, it, it, this is what you've got to remember. It's yeah. As much as, yeah, as, as much as we can't give, shall we say, 100% proof of survival, you know, the spirit world can't give a one, I'm oh, sorry, the, the scientific community can't give 100% proof of a, a golden research uh, study that conclusively proves or disproves afterlife either. You know? Yeah. So, um, it, yeah. Reminds me of the, uh, the Dalai Lama said, absence of proof is not proof of absence. Absolutely. Yeah, we said that. So we have time, actually, I have just one quick question. We've got time for one more question there from Arthur. Um, and he said the concept of biofeedback, which I suppose is similar to the idea of using the headset, how can we use that concurrent with the developing medium? So presumably this technology should be able to help us, um, at least with developing mediums, establish where they are in contact, where their mind has come into it, um, mm -hmm. stuff like that. So presumably, so biofeedback is, biofeedback is the same sort of idea, right? Yes, biofeedback uses the, uh, the skin conductance, mm. uh, predominantly use the skin conductance. You can, it does also sometimes use the heart rate and, uh, and breathing rate as well. Um, to, uh, and the idea is that these biofeedback monitors will, will, will give you a tone or give you a, a reading on the screen. And the idea is if you're viewing the screen and you're viewing the tone or listening to the tone, you should be able to control the uh, uh, you know that gives you the feedback path to know what's going on in your body so then you learn to adjust your own physiological responses to that thing um, and again neurofeedback 
is the same sort of thing as biofeedback. You know, neurofeedback gives you a visual representation of what's going on uh, in your brain. Um, sometimes a little games that you play, maybe it's, uh, you know, you've got to keep a ball floating in the, in the air or so forth. And you do that by relaxing your own brain or you do it by uh, adding concentration. So that as you're focusing, the more you focus, higher up the hot, hot air balloon, for example, there's one with the hot air balloon. So the more you focus, the more the hot air balloon um, goes up the scale. As soon as you lose your attention, lose your focus, the hot air balloon reduces. Now we know that to be a medium, you've got to have a good level of attention to be able to, to stay focused to the spirit world. You know, there's no point being aware of the spirit world one minute and then just being distracted on something else the next minute. You know, you've got to stay in that power, if we say, and be aware of the spirit world and stay focused. So uh, exercise, like neurofeedback exercises that may involve uh, training your attention, your attention span, would be useful in that respect. Yeah. Perfect. Lovely. So I just want to say thank you very much to Chris for joining us here this morning. And of course, thank you to all of you for joining us and contributing some very interesting questions to the discussion as well. And so I will just say sign off. Um, wish you all a very nice morning, afternoon or evening, wherever you are. And we will see you all back here again next month. Thank you again, Chris, very much. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks very much, everyone. Very interesting questions.